point, uh, we're looking to have some fun. So hopefully today's lecture, we can have some fun. And so, of course, we had to start off with some pie charts. <laughs> Nothing says fun like pie charts. Uh, yeah. It is interesting that uh, the world vineyard acreages, so Italy doesn't, you know, there's other countries that have more acreage of vineyards planted. Uh, I would love to see percent of country's land and then how much of that is planted by vineyards. I mean, Italy is just one giant vineyard. It really is. <laughs> it makes it difficult to study because every wine region uh, every region of Italy has wine, their own crazy rules and grapes that they grow. And uh. Yes, Italy's growing a lot of indigenous grapes, and they aren't necessarily grown in a lot of other places in the world, and there are a lot of them. Yeah. All right, so at that, we're just going gonna, gonna to roll right into it. And so welcome, everybody. Today we are discussing the white wines of Italy. Well, some of the white wines of Italy. Not really even, we're not even scratching the surface yeah. on the white wines <laughs> of Italy. Um, but, you know, we're here today to talk about the uh, Est, Est, Est and the Suave. Uh, so what are these things? Uh, most people might not have heard about these grapes. Um, everybody, I believe, has heard of Pinot Grigio, or at least has more data points, you know, more familiarity with the with the Pinot Grigio so we're offering an alternative uh, to those grapes uh, that's around the same price point and maybe the the mouthfeel will be a little bit nicer and cleaner for the price point that we're at all right so let's get into it so Est 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 what a crazy name so the story behind the name is what we're going to focus on at the beginning and then we're going to do the tasting of the Est 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 now we're going to talk about the DOC versus DOCG, what that means. We're going to get a little nerdy. We always do that after our first tasting. And then we're going to talk about the, the suave uh, at the end of our lecture here. So the story of Est, Est, Est is the journey of Bishop uh, Johann Fugger. And so he had to go from Germany to meet the Pope in Rome. And then he was going to go from a bishop to a cardinal. That's all he had to do. So, you know, he just could pay some money and hop on the, you know, on a flight, go right over the Alps, and he's there. Uh, but he couldn't, because this is a long, long time ago, and there was no planes, trains, or automobiles. And so he had to pack up his uh, entourage of people and set out on a journey. Pretty crazy journey. I mean, nowadays when we say we're international travelers, I mean, not like this year specifically, but, you know, it was like a really... You know, it's not that big of a feat. You get on a plane, you fall asleep, you wake up in a foreign land, and cool. These guys had to, you know, travel town to town, and they had to know where their villages were, where they could, you know, stop, get rest, food. Uh, more importantly for Fugger is his wine. He loved his wine. Uh, evidently, he was a fairly rotund man, very large and jolly, I guess. Uh, and so what he did was they knew, they plotted out their course, and... He sent Martine ahead of him, uh, and Martine's job was to go to the towns and drink the wine, and on the, you know, on the door, on a cobblestone somewhere, write the words "est," which means "good wine here," uh, and that sounds like a pretty good job. I mean, I would take that job. <laughs> I mean, I guess I would rather be Fugger in this in this story, but being Martine and. You know, just traveling a day ahead as a scout for wine, I could, I could get behind Sounds that. Sounds all right. Sounds all right. Yeah. So every time uh, Fugert would get to the town, he would be like, he would see the Est, and he would ask the people where it is, and then he would go, and he would drink that wine. And then he found the town of Montefiascone, right next to this lake. And with that, he walked in. And on the door of the tavern was Est, Est, Est with exclamation points for evermore. And it was just, this is the best wine in the world. You must come here and drink it. And so he did. He drank that wine. And the story goes, he fell in love with the wine. And a day turned into two days, turned into three. I don't know. I don't know what the responsibilities of a bishop versus a cardinal is. But, uh, you know, he's only a day hike away from Rome at this point. And he now decides, nah, I'm not going to go any further. 
Uh, maybe he knew that he'd have to go back to Germany to be the Cardinal. And now he's in the middle of Italy, next to Rome, in this beautiful town. It sits on top of a hill, overlooks the lake, uh, and has great wine. Uh, grows the Trebbiano grape. So the story says that he did not, he drank the wine, and he did not go to Rome. He stayed there, he set down his roots, grew a vineyard himself, and uh, made it his home. All of his entourage stayed with him and uh, lived out his days there. Uh, upon his death, he said, you can have my inheritance to the town of Montefiascone, but on the anniversary of my death, please pour some wine over my grave. <laughs> and so they do. And the thing is, is that people love any reason to party. This is maybe folklore, maybe it's true, maybe some of the details are a little embellished, but man, does the town just really go crazy. I mean, they have live music. Uh, they have a moped gallery. There's a parade with donkeys having rosemary in the satchel. I mean, people, this is some serious outfits that these that the townspeople have. Uh, so they take it pretty seriously. And they still pour the, uh, the wine over his tombstone grave site. I'm not quite sure where he's buried. I don't know if anybody really, I think they just sprinkle wine, intentionally or unintentionally, on the, on the land and cobblestones around. And so Est, Est, Est uh, has a great story. It's the Trebbiano grape. It's, uh, it's a fairly inexpensive wine to drink, and a lot of wine experts really kind of poo-poo the wine. Uh, but with the branding, they really kind of lean into the story behind it because it's a lot of fun to tell, to know, to think about while we're drinking the wine. So that's what we're going to get into now. The drinking of the wine, yes. And so our, our, our fun little game, and I'm glad to see so many people on the, on the webcams. Uh, so thumbs up for the first picture and peace sign or victory sign for the, uh, for the second uh, tasting note. All right. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. 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 So glad to see everybody here. It's really great. So on this one, We, I, I, I feel like I need a little uh, a buzzer. So it's like you get three seconds and then you have to make a decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see yeah. peace signs. Yeah, I'm seeing Ooh, like peace signs. We're getting a little hu some honeydew in here. Ah. Yeah. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm very astute observation so it's uh the different parts of this come through at different times sometimes on the smell we're getting we're getting one attribute and then on the on the on the palette we're getting a, a different one uh all right so let's go on to the next one peaches or lemons and i feel it's interesting the more you get into wine the more you start to realize about culinary art altogether. Saying lemon and peaches just really isn't even enough. People will be like, oh, what kind of lemon? What kind of peach? White peach? Over-ripened peach? I, I, cooked, stewed, cooked, stewed, dried. <laughs> and lemon, Meyer lemon versus? Yeah. I, I don't even. All right, but. So the nose on this is a little, a little closed. It's not as aromatic as some of the other white wines that um, exist. Mm. Yeah. I'm getting lemon. Are we getting both? Ooh, All right. We have some people that are getting a little bit of both. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Yeah, some peach. I do, there is some really nice undertones of peach. The acidity, I do feel, yeah. is kind of lemonish. I might have to. You, you're going to, you're going to, whatever this. <laughs> All right. And then the last one. Um, <clears throat> That's salt. I, you know, salt's an interesting picture to try to, to get in there. Um, or pineapple, like tropical fruits. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of salinity, um, like a saltiness, whether it's uh, seashell is what the tasting notes um out on the interwebs say but i think it's more of just saltiness i the melon from the loire valley 
Uh, that is really nail on the head uh, seashell. seashell. Yeah. Uh, this does have a nice salinity though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so in the bottom of the picture, we have uh, a picture of the town of Montefiascone uh, and what it looks like. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I believe that... Uh, Ooh, we have a food oh. pairing going on over here. Oh, very nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we have somebody on the on the webcam showing us so mary what uh what is that if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself because we can't the reading the label is a little harder yeah we do have everyone muted on entry so, so if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself so with the wine tastings um you know seafood would go really well with these okay we can hear you <laughs> Oh, very, okay. So they're eating olives, and uh, and the saltiness from the olives would kind of mask a little mm. bit of that. Uh, but they should play very well together. Uh, the acidity of the wine with the saltiness from the olives should be playing very nicely together. Uh, that's why olives are a really great uh, combination for white wines that are high in acid. Well, we also have some pretty <laughs> That sounds wonderful. Sounds great. Um, yeah, doing, you know, what grows together goes together. So caprese salads, uh, you know, vinaigrettes, some oils and salts on your pasta. Those types of dishes will be really, really nice uh, mm -hmm. with this type of wine. All right. So while we get into a little bit of the nerdy stuff, uh, feel free to drink your Est 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 wine. Uh, and we're going to get into it. So DOC, DOCG. We see these on the labels uh, often. And I don't know about you guys, but when I first started drinking wine, I knew DOCG was better than You're DOC. Like, it's good. It's good. But wh what does it really mean? Is it really worth that extra $5, $10? Um, what, is it, what does it mean? And I think also one thing before we get into it is when we're doing these wine tastings, a lot of times we pick like a region in France, um, Italy, Spain, and they have these indications, but maybe you can't get the specific wine. If you get a wine from that region, it's supposed to kind of have the same characteristics. So you could still follow along and, and, and get a lot out of these kind of Maybe there's a little bit of difference in what you're experiencing versus everybody else, but it shouldn't be that far off because they're regulated and because there's a, a body that says this is what it's supposed to be. Um, and through the winemaking practices and the terroir and just the history of the grapes, um, they should show well together. So DOC is Denominación de di Origine uh, Controlada y Garantita. Mm. I say it like a second grader learning Italian because that's not even what my reading level is for this. All right, so the first thing about a DOC, DOCG is a graphical area. So we're going to be, our case study today is Soave. And the graphical area is northeast Italy. We can see it in the little boot picture on the top right of Italy. Uh, and that region is Veneto. Then we go to the next chart over. It's the blown up version of Veneto. And inside of that is Suave. And then inside of Suave are like key indication areas that are highlighted that are better than other areas. And so we can have DOC and DOCG um, of the Suave area. And you can see how that can kind of fit into all of Italy. It's not just an Italian white. It's not a Veneto white. And it's, uh, it's a suave white wine. And so it's kind of like a little, what's that? The Chinese dolls? Like Russian, one well, Russian, Russian, dolls. Russian dolls, one inside of the other. Yeah. yeah. Nesting. Nesting, Nesting dolls. dolls. Nesting That's dolls. Right. Okay, so geographical area. And then acceptable grape varieties and the blends. So in the suave region, we have 70% uh, Garganega? Gargan... We looked this up. We, we did. looked up the pronunciation. Uh, we wanted to... Garganaga. Garganaga. Gar Garganaga. Uh, because it's, <laughs> like I got this. it's important for us to say the words correctly. And we really are trying to do that because uh, it's unlikely that many of you have seen this word before. So if we say it 
and butcher the language, <laughs> then you then you may say it's it later. Passing it on. And then that's not that's not what we're about here. Uh, so seventy percent has to be gar uh, garganega. 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 <laughs> you want to have the emphasis yes, on the gan. On the, gar, yeah, gar garganega. And then 30% maximum has to be Trebbiano and Chardonnay. And now in my math, I was just like, well, wait, but what does that, what does that mean? And the, because, you know, 70%, okay, maximum of 30. You can't go above 30. Uh, but it really kind of just sets this uh, 5% maximum of other authentic, non-aromatic white grapes. That's what that acronym means. Yeah. And so just what uh, what is the field blend that's thrown in there? And you really they have to be specific about the extra whites that are thrown in so that way you get the sense of um place. Place through this the grape. Yeah. Um and that's really what we're going to be tasting when we drink the suave. <laughs> All right. So the next uh control on the wine that's produced is how much residual sugar uh, remains in the glass. So these are dry. Uh, you can't go above 0.6% residual sugar. Um, and that has a lot to do with the ripening of the grapes and then how long fermentation is. Um, you know, I don't think that sweetness would do much for this wine. And so they don't think so either. So they set it at a very, very low residual sugar. And now we get into a little bit of the differences. What are the differences between DOC and DOCG? Uh, and it's uh, minimum alcohol content. You have to have a higher minimum alcohol content and then you have better wine. Um, I'm not quite sure, I, you know, that's just what it is. Uh, you know, why, and across the board, the more established regions, the DOCGs, they have these higher minimum alcohol content requirements and uh, I believe that it has to do with how the grapes mature in the fields. And so if they can't reach that minimum alcohol content, then it probably means that they had too many bunches on the grapes or on the, on the vines. Um, they didn't uh, mature fast enough. They were picked too early. Um, a lot, a myriad of reasons why the minimum alcohol content gives you a fair look into how the wine was produced. Um, next, aging time. Uh, so two to four months for the DOC and then the DOCG gets higher and this aging time this is across the board if you go to Rioja your nicer Riojas in terms of the terminology that they use between uh, Reserva um, it's how long everything needs to be aged in the aging conditions okay and then just to wrap it up other types of regulations that can be um, in on a region is yields per pressing so on the first press how much free run can you pull from uh, you know a certain amount of weight of grapes uh, harvesting time like when can you go out into the field to pick and then even specifically is your vineyard at a certain elevation if it's not at that elevation you can just not be a doc or docg it doesn't matter um, so fascinating and now life is suave <laughs> uh, i'm so happy right now i'm on uh i'm on vacation it's it's hard right now to uh take a vacation in the in the uh, you know in the environment that we have but uh you know these wine lectures really kind of help put me in a nice mood disconnect from the work and plug into drinking wine with everybody here uh pretty pretty pictures this is a medieval castle yes the castle in the town of suave from the 10th century so very very old, <laughs> very old. uh and then the vineyards uh and the grapes Wonderful, beautiful pictures. Uh, you can see the nice, the nice hills uh, that really just help with the, uh, you know, the drainage and and the the grapes to grow uh, to their full extent. All right, and now uh, we've seen these tasting notes again, and so uh, the grapes that we're drinking today have the same tasting notes. Uh, so we can play this game uh, with both of them. From like the books, the authorities that, that, that lean into this. This one's a bit closed as well. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the, the thumbs up. A lot more honeydew on the note than the first one. Mm -hmm. um, Especially in comparison. In comparison, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is. <laughs> if, if somebody didn't know what a honeydew smelled like, you could give them this wine and... Yeah. Okay. So, that was a pretty easy one. So now we're back to the lemon and peach. Mmm. I like the mouthfeel on this wine a little bit more than the than the Tarante or in the yeah, the Trebbiano. Yeah. Very crisp lemon. I'm getting on this one. Mm-hmm. It's nice. It's nice. Mmm. I do kind of pick up a little bit of like a white peach as well. Mm. Um, maybe not like a really juicy peach, but right. a, not but the a yellow very, peaches. Not the yellow peaches, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. Right, not that picture, but mm -hmm. all right. And then our very last one. It's a softball pitch for everybody here. Salt or pineapple? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, I really get through the mid palate, like in, in terms of the time. Again, and I, we do have some pineapple in here. All right. There's a little bit of a tropical note. There is a tropical note mm -hmm. in this. Mm. I think the maybe like I'm gonna go with the. All right, so now <laughs> so now we're gonna go with uh, one, one or two versus which do you prefer the Trebbiano that we had from Est 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 or the Suave? The Suave is gonna be number two, the peace sign for everybody. Two. Very, very. I, yep. Yeah, I like that description a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Both have very nice acidity, but the body of the Suave grape in this specific wine is much fuller, rounder, nicer, um, and you just can engage with this wine a heck of a lot more than the Trebbiano. Um, the situation with the Trebbiano, it would be great in a, in a, in a wine spritzer, uh, in sangria as, a, as your white wine. Um, a good base wine, and as you said, um, something to drink on the back porch while you're sure. hanging out. I mean, I think it pair, it pair really easily with a lot of foods as well, so it, you know, it's kind of a more versatile. I think uh, especially barbecue type like backyard barbecue types of food hot dogs with this again that saltiness with the high acid and no body play would go very well we may have tried that we may have tried that it was <laughs> it was wonderful um but then once i had like baked beans i did prefer the suave with like that that kind of that molasses sugary note the body kind of helped play well with the the baked beans and like a, maybe even a little bit of a mayo because the mayo is just going to have a little bit more body to it um that the the trebbiano is going to just feel flat and not bring a whole lot to the table it's not even going to really cleanse your palate in that in that situation but it can with a you know hot dog with ketchup uh so these wines are again you know just kind of replacements for pinot grigio and so you know as we uh conclude the lecture portion of this uh you know i hope you guys enjoyed the story of s s s montefiascone and uh and the suave grape uh garganega 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it one day. we'll get it one day now i've said it too many times i'm not even thinking anymore but uh yeah so uh the next one that we're gonna have uh just if anybody's before we get into the kind of the discussion part of it, it's gonna be at the start of next month. We're gonna do a BYOB, bring your own Bordeaux blend. Uh, we're gonna be drinking a uh, three bottles. Uh, we'll talk about how you can do that at home to not you know, uh, drink three bottles in one day or <laughs> throw any of them away. But so we're gonna do one from Bordeaux, one from uh, California, and then one from Virginia and try to get one that is Cabernet Sauvignon based, one that is Merlot based, and one that is Cab Franc. The Virginia Cab Franc 
I believe is a very great grape to experience. And so we're gonna try them all side by side and that's gonna be a really nice tasting. Uh, so that concludes the tasting portion or the lecture portion, so.